leaders in the Republican Party. I am not sure that that, that, that might just begin to fade away because I think over time people are going to wake up and say, look, I just saw a poll the other day that said like 85% of the American people want the Congress to work together. I am not convinced that he's going to have the power that we think he's going to have. Part of it's going to be up to the media as to whether they want to give him oxygen or not. I'm whether they you. want to um, give him. John, I'm with you that. If well, we're enough to get to that place. Yeah. Last word to you, X. Yeah, yeah, part of the uh, part of this is where the voters go, John. Eighty-three percent of Republicans say they doubt the legitimacy of the outcome of this election. He's already had a corrosive impact, and if these Republicans, right. there may be some heroes among them, but if these Republican members think they're risking their careers uh, by defying yeah. him. Uh, they're gonna, they're, uh, very few of them are going to be Profiles and Courage. That's why Profiles and Courage was such a thin uh, volume. I, I, I would just con conclude by saying this. That Republican Party ain't what she used to be. There are a lot of people that left that party who are no longer in that party. And that base has shrunk. How much it's shrunk, we'll have to see. But well, David, there are a lot of people that left and helped elect Joe Biden, President of the United States, um, who were Republicans. Well, look. So you know, they like to play with see. they like to play with ugly language about what comes next and violence and this and that. No, it, it's got to be about decisions about men and women of goodwill. We'll see if your party really changes and splinters off. We'll see if it happens on the left. Who knows? Uh, there are a lot of reasons to believe if you can keep the money even, you'd be better off with four than two parties. But we are in a moment in history right now, and I think people are sleeping on how significant this is. But we will see in the coming days what this will mean for our collective history. David Axelrod, John Kasich. I'm honored to share Thank this you. moment with you two men of goodwill. <laughs> Thank you. And look, I know you keep saying Thank we shouldn't have to talk about the election anymore, but this is what happens when people in power are willing to poison a process. I should be talking to you about the pandemic killing more of us than ever before in a single day. But it doesn't work. We're not moved. We're moved by animus and division, and I can't stop it. But I have something you need to hear. The adults, the deaths, the numbers, it's numbing. What about the kids? I heard something today that just broke my heart, and I didn't think that could happen anymore. But if you want some context of what's happening this holiday season, I want you to hear from some kids. And I want to bring on one of the lawmakers who can still have a chance at making something rational happen when it comes to relief. Let's get after it. Cuomo Primetime is brought to you by Vru. You gave out a statistic yesterday on the quadrillion statistic in terms of uh, a stats you gave out. I, I listened to that and I was blown away. And I watched the mob and the media, you know, just like they, they actually attacked your real affidavits until the real people that signed them showed up and then, oh, Kaylee was telling the truth. Oh, they forgot that part. But explain how you got that number. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because you had fake news CNN saying that the affidavits I were showing were blank when all you had to do was go look at a public court filing to read them uh, yourselves. But of course they couldn't do that. That's the job of a reporter. But instead I'm having to do their job for them, including with this number. Uh, the stat I gave last night, which is eye-opening and truthful, is that for, the, for President Trump to be ahead as far as he was at 3 a.m. in these four states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, and for the vote to swing by as much as it did, the probability of that in one state is one in one quadrillion. That's one comma 15 zeros. Uh, to happen in all four, it's one comma 15 zeros to the fourth power. And because Jake Tapper, fake news CNN, and others can't uh, wake up and find enough energy to go read a public court filing, I, I did it for them. You can find the sworn declaration uh, by Charles Cassetti, who, by the way, PhD from Rutgers, tenured professor, expert testimony in hundreds of court cases, goes through meticulously how he used z-scores and standard deviations from a medium to come up with this median to come up with this number. So it's the job of a reporter to go find this. It's out there, it's public, and it's a dereliction of the duty and the job that each of these reporters have to not look into this, to not look at the sourcing, which is available for all to read and see. And just to emphasize what you found in Detroit, Wayne County, they list 174,384 absentee ballots out of 566,000, 100,000. 
absentee ballots tabulated 30 percent is counted without a registration number for precincts in the city of detroit uh i hope america's watching these are real numbers here kaylee thank you when we come back hunter biden confirming today he is under a federal investigation for his tax affairs and sources now telling fox news that it has to deal with links to china information you won't get from the media senator ron johnson of wisconsin peter schweitzer will join us live with a special report straight ahead hannity is brought to you by elkis results from all 50 states show that joe biden got 306 electoral votes he won by a very large comfortable margin he only needed 270 electoral votes to win he got 306 Every state is certified. It's over. On Earth One here, it's over. But now, 18 red states are fully on board with trying to get the Supreme Court to throw out that result and declare Trump the winner anyway. You know, over 3,000 Americans died from coronavirus today, in one day. The vaccine approval meeting for our country is tomorrow. Whether or not we have the wherewithal as a country to get together the number of vaccine doses we are going to need, since apparently the Trump White House told the vaccine companies we didn't need too many. Whether or not we as a country are going to have the wherewithal to run a vaccine administration program that can vaccinate 300 plus million people in anywhere near the time needed to save hundreds of thousands of American lives that are on the line. That starts now. That work needs to be done now. That is not something that we need to wonder about. That's something we need to start doing. This vaccine can start going into American arms tomorrow. We've got stuff to do. I mean, in Congress, today they decided they would fund the government for one more week. Because <clears throat> otherwise the government was going to run out of money and shut down and they can't agree on what they're going to do for new COVID relief, if they're going to do anything 11 months into this disaster. Oh, buy us another week. We can't figure out what to do. 3,000 Americans dead today. The vaccine approval starts likely tomorrow. No COVID relief in how many months now? I mean, there is stuff to do. There is stuff to do. But this is what we're doing instead. Follow the lead of the Kamala Harris birther guy. 18 states and the president saying, no, 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 we're going to try to get this election overturned. Supreme Court will do it. This is what we're working on. This is what the Republican Party is working on now. Joining us now is Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro. Pennsylvania is, of course, one of the states being sued by Texas and 17 other Republican-controlled states that are trying to have Pennsylvania's election results thrown out. Uh, Attorney General Shapiro, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Rachel. Um, I'm a I apologize for being a little head up. I'm a little... Uh, I, I, I feel some perfect. personal emotion. You set it up. Well, for let me ask you if it, okay. Tell tell me if I got any of it wrong or if I put the wrong emphasis on any of this. No, I mean I, I was going to use a more diplomatic phrase like uniquely unserious to describe the lawsuit. I think you just went with dumb and stupid. I'll adopt your terms. Uh, it it really is, and it is based on this this lawsuit, based on debunked tweets and conspiracy theories lies that haven't held up in court. And now we find ourselves with the president and some of these attorneys general trying to spin their wheels and uh, thwart the will of the people in at least four states. You and your fellow attorneys general from Michigan and Wisconsin issued a statement um, after this lawsuit was filed. Um, calling it an, an insignificant attempt. You said these insignificant attempts to disregard the will of the people in our, in our states mislead the public and tear at the fabric of our Constitution. And that's, that's exactly where I'm at with this story. I both believe that this is insignificant and frivolous and, forgive me, but sort of dumb, and also that it's dangerous because it is making a mockery of the idea of Democrat, of the democratic process be the way that we settle things in this country, and making a mockery of the idea that the court should be uh, should be called upon to dis, to decide legitimate differences that require judicial intervention rather than just partisan power. You know, Rachel, I would I would just say they're attempting to make a mockery of it. 
You know, for the last four years, the President of the United States has attacked every institution, including the courts. But what we have seen throughout this process, a process that began in Pennsylvania before Election Day and has gone on since, is that the courts have held, uh, federal courts and state courts, justices and judges that were appointed by Republicans and Democrats or elected as Republicans or Democrats, they have abided by the rule of law. And, you know, law enforcement officials like me have stood up and said, look, we're going to root out any type of voter fraud. We haven't seen any. And we're going to stand up to the attacks on our system. We have weathered that. It is, of course, sad that we have a president of the United States who is attempting to sow doubt and in some people's minds has succeeded. It is sad that we have this lawsuit filed by the attorney general of Texas. And I will tell you, Rachel, it's especially sad for me that 17 other attorneys general have gone along with this process. By the way, some Mm -hmm. attorneys general that I've worked with, you talked about it a few moments ago, the Facebook lawsuit that we filed today. And, you know, we've worked constructively in the past. I don't know, you know, whether to to call a a surgeon to try the spines of some of these individuals or a psychiatrist to examine their heads. But something's wrong. Uh, They are afraid of something. And it is up to us to continue to speak truth. And it is up to the courts to continue to do what they've been doing, which is to follow the law. And here's what I know to be true. On Monday, the Electoral College will meet and they will issue 306 votes for Joe Biden, and he will be sworn in as the next president of the United States on January the 20th. Pennsylvania Attorney General. uh... It's incredibly difficult to nurture and take care of your kids. Um, During this time, we're all worried about keeping our kids safe, and so many Americans are worried about keeping their kids fed, about keeping a roof over their head. This is a crisis. We have an epidemic of COVID, but we also have an epidemic of hunger, an epidemic of housing insecurity, an epidemic of unemployment. What we do not have is an epidemic of lawsuits. And Senator Mitch McConnell is the problem here. It's not Democrats, it's not even Republicans. It's coming down to one person, Mitch McConnell, who wants to give his big donors giveaways and kowtow to them instead of helping hungry kids. So let me ask you a couple of is it truths. Uh, forgive the leading nature. Uh, is it true that McConnell is saying that the emergent circumstances of hunger and of need for checks is equal by the needs of employers to be protected from lawsuits that may come in the future from people who get sick at work? Yes, he's holding up COVID relief and has been holding up COVID relief for months and months, six months in fact, because we because we do not want to give big corporations a license to kill their employees, a license to kill nursing home patients, a license to kill patients. That's what this is about. And you know, it's not like we don't have workers comp. You know, it's not like there aren't already big legislative structures in place to help negotiate these kinds of labor uh, versus management issues. Is it also true that McConnell is at once arguing, I have to do the liability stuff now, I won't get another chance, at the same time that he is arguing, I don't have to do relief checks now because we'll get another chance? I think that's a disgusting argument. And to be clear, we don't have to give corporations immunity to knowingly and recklessly put workers and patients in harm's way ever. We have a legal standard that already provides protections, a legal standard that actually grew out of the deaths, the maimings that were occurring with railroad workers about 100 years ago in this country. But we don't have to give corporations anything, but kids, hungry families, they can't wait one more day. What happened between but please send to your colleague, Senator Grassley, and I know he recovered fully from COVID. I know you did as well. I, I, I want to hone in on this, though, very, very closely here. If you don't have experience and you're getting paid millions, and then you have your, your father bragging that on tape he leveraged a billion taxpayer dollars and gave them six hours to fire the prosecutor investigating the son making millions with zero experience, how is that not a quid and a pro and a quo? I, I mean, where I grew up, that would be a quid pro quo. 
Well, it is. It's obvious to everybody except the mainstream media. And of course, we found out now the mainstream media had far greater influence and interference in our election than any Russian interference ever could have hoped for. I mean, the fact of the matter, there have been polls out now, the McLaughlin poll said that 36% of Biden voters had never heard of the Hunter Biden story because of the censorship and suppression. Of that, 13%, once they found out, said they wouldn't have voted for Biden. So that means 4.6% of Biden voters would not have voted for him. That means Trump would have won the election. That's the enormous influence that social media and our liberal bias media played on this election. Their, their interference it just is orders of magnitude greater than any Russian or Chinese or Iran foreign interference in this in this campaign. Senator, do me a favor. Don't leave the U.S. Senate. I heard you haven't made up your mind yet. I'm, I'm encouraging you to stay there. You, uh, we just heard from Reince Priebus. He outlined what went on in terms of uh, you don't have absentee or you don't have early voting and, and all the rules that were not followed in your state of Wisconsin, and I'm fond of your state. Um, and you have also said you don't rule out the possibility of cha challenging electoral college results in the news that 17 attorney, attorneys general now have, have joined with Texas is big news tonight. Your thoughts? Well, well one of the things I'm going to do is I schedule a hearing for next Wednesday when we're going to examine the irregularities of the 2020 election. So some of these irregularities are being examined by courts and some of them have been dealt with. But the ones that, that remain on next Wednesday, we're, we're going to bring in, for example, an attorney from Wisconsin. They're going to describe what the Reince was talking about. We're bringing an attorney from, from Nevada, where there are like 42,000 people that voted twice, absentee and in person. Dead people voted. Out-of-state people voted. So we're going to ask these questions. What about this truckload of ballots from Great Plains, New York, headed toward uh, Philadelphia? You know, how do you explain that type of thing? So you know, yeah. we're going to hold we're going to hold that hearing, and we're going to ask those questions, and we're going to ask you know for, for explanations because the American people deserve to know what happened. This is a terrible state of affairs where you have a great percentage of the American public that don't view this election as, as uh, legitimate because the Democrats pushed the envelope. They did everything they could to make this a suspicious result. Are the people in Wisconsin understanding what went on here. I believe so. I was a little disappointed the Supreme Court of Wisconsin didn't take it up right away. But again, that's, that's why I'm going to hold this hearing, because the American people need to hear it. Because once again, the news media is suppressing this. They're, they're not covering you know, the, the hearings on this. They're not covering the issues with any kind of detail. They just gloss that right over like they did the Ukrainian-Biden uh, affair. Just said, oh, it's all been debunked. No, it ha these things haven't been debunked. They're legitimate yeah. questions that need to be answered. All right, Senator. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Now, remember Peter Schweitzer, friend of this program? Well, he broke right here on this program in his, his great book, Secret Empires, in 2018, the extent of Hunter's dealings, exposing how Hunter Biden inked these sweetheart deals one after another, despite no experience, no qualifications, all while profiting off of his father's diplomacies overseas. And here to explain more and react to tonight's breaking news is Peter Schweitzer. My sources say this investigation has actually been ongoing since 2018. It is a real investigation, and he may now be the target of an investigation. And uh, the news was about to have to break on this one way or the other, and it was going to be exposed. Let me ask you first about China. He said in that GMA interview, I never got a penny from China. Was he lying? <laughs> Well, he didn't get a penny from China. He got millions and millions of pennies from China. Yeah, no, he's absolutely lying. Um, and, and the thing to keep in mind here, Sean, is there's a multitude of deals with China. You've got the $1.5 billion private equity deal where he joins the board and he gets an equity stake. You've got Rosemont Realty in which a Chinese company called Gemini with links to the Chinese military comes in and buys that firm. Hunter is involved in that deal. Uh, we know about the CEF uh, activities. Part of the challenge here is we don't know the full extent to what Hunter Biden was doing because he had a myriad of accounts offshore overseas. Um, and what I would say, Sean, is let's keep in mind, this is being presented as a tax case. One of the reasons prosecutors would want to lead with a tax case is the United States has tax treaties with countries around the world that allows for a lot more broad information sharing when you're investigating a tax case than 
if you're investigating something else. So I don't think there should be any, any comfort to the Biden family that this is only a tax case. Uh, I think this is sort of the camel's nose under the tent. Uh, this gives them an opportunity to gain access uh, to foreign bank accounts, foreign transactions, etc. And we can start to unravel the full extent of the Biden relationship with the Chinese government. Between light blue line, that's the number of confirmed COVID cases in the county, confirmed by traditional testing, people who already had the virus. You see that big spike sort of toward the end of the month back in May 2020? But look at the dark blue line. The dark blue line is the results of wastewater tests, the concentrated amount of virus they found in the sewers in Newcastle County, Delaware. The amount of virus in the wastewater directly tracks with, direct, direct, directly predicted the cases going up in that one Delaware County, predicted the spike a full week before any sick people started getting tested and turning up positive. I mean, it's, it's kind of you know, gross to think about testing wastewater. It might even make you laugh to, to talk about it. It makes me giggle every time I think about it. But also, this is super rational, cheap, effective and it's the only way to sort of see into the future in, in in individual communities. This kind of testing works. It helps you spot and prepare for and mitigate a COVID outbreak before you even know it's there. It can give you an early warning. One U.S. city has just found this past week when it turns out an absolute tidal wave of virus is approaching your shores. This kind of testing within the past week in one major U.S. city just revealed a huge, huge unforeseen new spike in cases bigger than anything they have dealt with in the pandemic thus far. Thus far. What do they do with that information in that city now that they know what is coming? Because they can see it in their wastewater before they can see it in their test results. That story's next. Stay with us. Pop our anxieties, our hopes for a speedy resolution to the current deadlock. Recommendations. Uh, immediately after performing a thorough review, rather than dismiss. People everywhere living with type 2 diabetes. Make it, don't make it! I don't intend to! Good! Well, I'm glad that's settled. The only thing that's settled around here is that I'm going to bed. Good night. Personally, for that reason, too, let me just ask you if I've explained any of this wrong or if I'm, I'm putting the emphasis on any, any wrong parts of this. No, I think you've done a great job explaining it. I mean, we're, we've been learning to use wastewater. They're actually examples going back um, previous decades where it's been used to predict cholera outbreaks, for example, um, by looking at wastewater and seeing if there's vibrio cholera in, in the wastewater and then and then knowing that it's circulating in the community before an actual outbreak occurs. Um, but this is a more modern use with much better technology. And as you stated, the numbers, you know, the, the rapid rise in the greater Boston area is extremely worrisome. What is the right response once you have the benefit of that new technology and that um, pretty precise data? Once you get a warning like this, that this is what's coming, I mean, seeing the size of that spike, uh, it's scary and it tells me what's going to happen in eastern Massachusetts um, over the next few days and the next couple of weeks. But how do you respond to it? How can you use this in a way that might help? Well, I think I think the time to use it is early when it's starting to rise and not letting it go up too far. I mean, I, I think the issue now is we need to intensify control measures. Um, and, and Governor you know, Charlie Baker has done that just a little bit in the last few days by trying to restrict the size of gatherings and the you know, number of people in restaurants or occupancy of restaurants. But we may need to cut down even further. I mean, if we compare what we're doing to, say, Montreal and Canada, and with similar numbers, everybody's at home and can't go out. I mean, it's really shut down. So you know, there's different levels of intensity, and I, I think everybody wants to keep the economy open. But right now, we have a pretty high-risk situation, and, and at least in the Boston area. And actually, we don't have wastewater collection like this going on in other parts of the state, but, but the proportions of positive tests in other parts of the state are quite worrisome. 
Would you suggest that other parts of the country um, that have the opportunity to do testing like this and aren't yet doing it, would you suggest this as a cost-effective public health monitoring tool? I, I feel like the advantage to this data Part of the advantage here is that you don't actually need to be a real expert to understand what this means. Once you can get over sort of the giggle factor for the fact that we're talking about sewage and measuring it that way, I do think that people can look at graphs like we're seeing out of the greater Boston area right now and understand, oh man, look what's coming. Uh, it feels like even just for a public awareness um, in terms of that sort of a payoff, this is something we ought to be doing more of in this country. No, I agree with that. I, I mean, actually, there, there are a number of different projects, both municipal and then at, at the university level in different parts of the country that have been doing this. And Arizona, uh, University of California, San Diego, um, they, they've used this to try and identify sort of foci, you know, sort of spots on campus where there's a an outbreak or an impending outbreak. And then they can go in and intensify control measures, do more testing, identify who's, who's infected, isolate them, quarantine their contacts, and, and try and limit spread. Uh, so, so I think it can be done both at a large scale, like a, a city, but even better yet, at a smaller scale, a building. Like, for example, if you were to do it, um, test the sort of the wastewater coming out of a skilled nursing facility. If you did that for every skilled nursing facility, you could identify early an outbreak and, and come in and try and control it before it, it ravaged that center. For example, and there's very many other examples. Very practical advice. Yeah. Uh, Dr. David Hamer, Professor of Global Health and Medicine. Could adjust my patent and fill so that you could have the exact support you need as an individual, regardless of your sleep position. I also wanted a pillow that stays. Now we've created a brand new way for you to sell your car. Whether it's a year old or a few years old, we want to buy your car. Manufacturing in my home state of Minnesota. I personally guarantee until you've done a little browsing around my tailgate. <laughs> I personally guarantee until you've done a little browsing around my tailgate. <laughs>